परात्मानेकम जगत्जीजमाद्यम गुरीहं निरातारमोंकार वेद्यम यतो जायते पाल्यते ये न दुष्टम समीशं भजे लियते यत्र विश्वं अरियों तस्त अरियों तस्त अरियों तस्त तो दिया दिया दी Let us continue our study of this thirteen chapter. <clears throat> we saw in the last class that Krishna had kept before us a group of disciplines and virtues to be practiced, and these virtues are extremely important. it is these virtues and disciplines which actually make us competent and eligible to experientially realize and understand the true nature of ishvara so this 13th chapter commenced with a beautiful distinction being made between what is kshetra and what is kshetrakya what is the field and who is the knower of the field and then krishna in detail he described what this field is what this kshetra is and after describing that which is kshetra means everything that is known to us everything that which we are not that is the central point kshetra is that which we are not we cannot be the kshetra so this we had seen in detail starting from the avyaktam the maya down to everything that we are seeing and perceiving here means the entire changing dimension everything that is changing we cannot be that this is the one conclusion what we are not now what we are that is the next point Presently, let us first understand what we are not. This everything that is changing, it is continuously getting changed. As Shankara Charya says, "Pratikshana manyatha sabhava." If you remember the 15th chapter which we have studied, the 15th chapter starts with a wonderful description of this samsara brikshya. the tree of the samsara this entire scene which we are seeing it is described to a tree a vriksha and if you remember we had seen bhagwan krishna says that this samsara vriksha is ashwatham literally we have an ashwatha vriksha a banyan tree ashwatham literally means that which is not shashwatham that which actually doesn't exist but which appears to be existing so this entire scene which we are seeing it is a very mysterious thing but we have an unquestioned sense of realism about this what we are seeing and whatever is seen is kshetra in the terminology of the 13th chapter Bhagwan Krishna is saying, "This is all Kshetra, which you are not." Now, if we have to understand what we are, our true nature, which is Kshetragya, Kshetragya is our true nature. We are that. 
But if we have to understand the true nature of the Kshetrajya, who is the knower of the field, we first need to have some competence, some eligibility, without which, no matter, we may read books, we may talk about it, that Kshetrajya, the real nature of Kshetrajya, will never become a matter of experience to us. God will not be a matter of experience to us as long as we don't put these virtues into practice. As long as we don't practice these disciplines, God is never going to be a matter of experience to us. So we saw the list of beautiful disciplines which are indispensable. Let us keep one point in our minds. Bhagavad Gita is a moksha shastra. This book is meant for those who are really serious about Khandana Bhava Bandhana. Let us make this point very clear. Those who are not serious about Khandana Bhava Bandhana, this book is not going to be directly relevant to them. Only those who really want freedom from bondage, those who want freedom from misery and suffering, they are welcome to read Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Bhagavad Gita is a book meant for them who really want freedom from bondage. For curiosity mongers, it won't work actually. If we are really serious about putting an end to all the sufferings and miseries that we usually go through, if we are really serious about it, then this is the book. Bhagavan Krishna shows that royal path through which we can put an end to all our sufferings and misery and experience that limitless joy and bliss. So what are the practices? If we have to really put an end to all the miseries of life, then the practices are, it started with Amanitvam, humility, Adambitvam, unpretentiousness, Ahimsa, non-injury, Kshanti, forbearance, Arjavam, simplicity, straightforwardness, Acharya Pasanam, service to the Guru, Shaucham, cleanliness, internal as well as external, Sthairyam, Spirata, and steadfast on the path of self-knowledge. And Atma Vedikraha means complete self-control, self-restraint, gaining mastery over one's body, sense organs, and the mind. We cannot let our body and mind do whatever it wants. If we are really serious about this pursuit of self-knowledge, if we are really serious about this pursuit of Ishwara Gyan, then one has to be serious about Atma Vedikraha. It's a complete transformation in our lifestyle. The lifestyle which is given to a complete self-mastery. The mastery over one's body, mind and sense organs. Indriyartheshu Vairagya. This passion for the objects of pleasure. Anahankara. No egotism. Absence of egotism. And Janma Mrityu Jara Vyati Sukha Doshanu Varsnam. Seeing evil in Janma Mrityu Jara Vyati. It's all fraught with evil. It's all Dukkham. Janma is Dukkham. Mrityu is Dukkham. Jara means old age. Is Dukkham. Vyati means disease. Is Dukkham. Everything is brought to the tongue. This deep insight into the nature of human life, starting from birth till death. It is all Dukkham. Where is Sukham here? Only a Aviveki, a Moorha, a foolish person thinks that there is Sukham here. A wise man sees very clearly that there is not one drop of Sukham in this world. So the list continues. Then Bhagavan Krishna says, 
असक्तिरनिष्वंग पुत्रदार गृहादिषु नित्यं च समचित्तत्व इष्टा निष्टोपत्तिषु असक्ति असक्ति मीन्स वॉट नॉन अटैचमेंट सी दीज आर द वर्चूज विच वी हैव टू प्रैक्टिस इन ऑपोजिट ऑफ नॉन अटैचमेंट इज वॉट अटैचमेंट वॉट इज अटैचमेंट शंकराचार्य से इज ब्यूटिफुल वी आर कंटिन्यूसली एसोसिएटिंग विद डिफरेंट थिंग्स एंड वर्ष and when we continuously associate that is human life in human life we are in constant touch with different things and persons around us and owing to this continuous association with things and persons we develop a liking for that thing and that liking turns into a passion so a liking owing to continuous association A liking which turns into attachment. See the psychology of it. When we are continuously in association with, with certain things and persons, that association takes the form of liking initially, initially, and later on it transforms into attachment. Attachment means we get stuck up there. We begin to stick. And non-attachment is just the opposite. Not sticking to anything. it's the real art of living we talk about art of living is it not the real art of human life is to live in such a way that we are with everybody and yet we are not stuck up anywhere what a beautiful thing it is bhagavad gita's central idea is the idea of this of this non attack that's why gita is also described as anasakti yoga and krishna gives a beautiful illustration he says we have to live in this world just like a lotus leaf floating on the water padma patram ivam phasa he says just like a lotus leaf floating on the water you see the lotus leaf is in the water but the water cannot stick to the lotus just pull the leaf up there is not one drop of water on it this is how krishna says we have to live in the world the leaf is in the water but it is absolutely not sticking to the water sri ramakrishna gives a very beautiful example live in the world like a maid servant living in a rich man's house beautiful the maid servant who is working in a rich man's house she is involved with everything now look at the language which shankaracharya is using here association when we are constantly in association with certain things and persons we develop liking first and then that liking transforms into attachment now that maid servant working in the rich man's house she is continuously associated with everything of that household with all persons children with the different things and commodities and yet being in that household and associated with everything she is absolutely non attached is it not if the owner of the house says from tomorrow you don't have to come she simply walks away she lived in the house she was in the midst of everything she was doing everything for the members of that household and yet she was absolutely unattached this is precisely what is the art of living in this world non attachment now this very attachment if it becomes intensified it turns into identification that is the next point abhishwanga abhishwanga means getting identified with the things and persons around us both these are connected with each other attachment when getting intensified it becomes self identification with these objects and persons attachment is asakti 
and when this asakti becomes intensified it becomes abhishvanga abhishvanga means getting identified with the persons and the things around us how do we understand it again shankaracharya in his commentary very beautifully he says what happens once we become deeply attached to the things and persons around us then whatever is happening to that thing or a person you will begin to feel as if it is happening to me somebody is dying in the house you feel as if you are dead your property is gone you feel as if i am gone mm-hmm. this is the kind of identification which we develop with kshetra see we how we get identified with kshetra the changing dimension that is why we suffer in life all the suffering the root cause of suffering we can read in the complete works of swami vivekananda in the karma yoga you can say swami ji says there is only one cause of suffering in the human life and that is attachment if we learn the art of living a life freed from this disease of attachment and self identification no misery can touch that person so these two things one is asakti and the second point is abhishvanga attachment and identification attachment and identification for whom putra dar grihad shu putra is what children dar spouses husband or wife either way and griha adi shu griha adi means house etc means everything that we are associated with whether it is human beings or things first we get attached and that attachment further intensifies and becomes identification and once you become identified then it is a very difficult situation then we have to dance to the tunes of those things that is precisely a state of bondage so the opposite of attachment and identification is non attachment and becoming non identified with any things around us so these two beautiful words asakti asakti and anabhishvanga asakti means non attachment and anabhishvanga non identification for what for children spouses house and all of the commodities developing this great virtue of non attachment and non identification then what nityam cha samachittatvam ishta anishta upapatti shu ishta upapatti and anishta upapatti in our life we constantly we experience this what is that sometimes we get things which are desirable and often we get things which are undesirable when we get things which are desirable we become very happy we become very elated that is the huge usual human behavior is like that when we get something which is desirable for us which is favorable to us we become elated and when we get something which is not desirable which is not favorable instantly our reaction is either anger or some negative kind of a reaction to it so krishna says can we develop a state of mind which is perfectly equipoised and equilibrium of the mental world mental equipoise this is a wonderful quality of the mind whether we get desirable thing whether we get favorable thing or whether we get undesirable and unpleasant thing the mind is always in a state of equanimity this is what is nityam cha samachittatva samachittata samachittata means a state of mind which is in perfect equilibrium never elated and never depressed whether good things come or whether negative and bad things come these are all great qualities to be developed if at all we have to move ahead in the direction of experiencing ishvara 
नित्यम च समचित इष्ट अनिष्ट उपपत्तिषु मई चानिन्योगे न भक्तिरव्यभिचारिणी विविक्त देश से विम अरतिर्जन संसदी मई च अन्योगे न भक्ति अव्यभिचारिणी अव्यभिचारी भक्ति दुर्भिचार भक्ति असी यू आर कमिंग टू भक्ति सो गुड The greatest pressure of human life is bhakti. Love for Ishwar, love for God. What is the meaning of human life if we have not learned to love Ishwar for the sake of Ishwar? Loving Ishwar for the sake of the world is no love. Usually, that is what we do. We are loving God for the sake of our samsara, so that God will take care of our samsara. That is not really bhakti. Real bhakti is what. Wanting God for the sake of God, that that is amazing. So this is what is referred to as avyabhichari bhakti. Avyabhichari bhakti means unwavering devotion for Ishwar. Unwavering. It never wavers. It is not that when God is doing giving some good things to us, then I love God. The moment something negative happens, means our love for God is gone. No, this is unwavering devotion. Devotion which doesn't vacillate, which is steady, irrespective of what happens in our human life. Avyabhichari bhakti, coupled with second point, ananya yoga. Another beautiful term. Ananya yoga means one-pointed concentration on Ishwar, where the mind is always in the mode of meditation. One pointed ananya means fully focused. One pointed yoga. Yoga here means meditation. So unwavering devotion coupled with continuous meditation on Ishvara. Just see what a beautiful description is. This is the life of all the sadhakas. Sadhakas' life will be like this. It will be a continuous unwavering. Devotion for Ishvara, coupled with a continuous state of mind which is meditative, which is focused on Ishvara and Ishvara alone. Why? Shankaracharya beautifully says in his commentary, this comes because that bhakta knows very well that there is nothing superior to Ishvara. And Ishvara is the only real thing which is existing, and Ishvara is the only goal that I have in my life. This is the conviction with which the devotee or the sadhaka lives. Once again, I repeat what Shankaracharya says: He lives with the conviction that bhakta or that seeker of God he lives with the firm conviction that there is nothing greater than God. Number one, and God is the only thing which is the reality. See Sri Ram Krishna's word: "Bhagavan hi ek matra vastu, baki sab avastu." God is the only thing which is actually existing. Everything else is appearing to be existing. Now we are totally identified with that which is appearing to be existing, and that is why we are suffering. This bhakta's conviction is that he is very clear. He knows there is nothing superior to Ishvara, and Ishvara alone is existing, and Ishvara is the only goal that I have in my life. Because of this conviction, his bhakti is unwavering; it never vacillates. Secondly, his meditation on Ishvara is unbroken. Ananya yoga. Yoga means meditation, concentration. His focus on God is never disturbed; it is unbroken. So, avya bhicharini bhakti and ananya yoga. These are the amazing qualities which one has to cultivate. For doing this, naturally, the next point. 
these are all connecting factors if one has got this kind of a mindset where the person is having an unbroken a state of mind in which the content of the mind is nothing but ishwara and ishwara alone and his devotion is absolutely unwavering obviously his tendency will be what you know the next sentence vivik pradesh sevak vam aratir jana samsadi his natural inclination in life will be to become vivikta sevi vivikta desha sevi vivikta desha sevi means what he will always be inclined to go into solitude this person is natural tendency will always be to go into solitude vivikta desha sevanam means vivikta desha means solitude and sevanam means always repairing to or going into solitude because it is only in solitude that the sadhaka in an unbroken way he can commune with ishvara who is residing in our hearts so vivekta desha se vidvam and arati jana sampati arati arati means he literally dislikes the congregation or gathering of worldly people arati means rati and arati rati means to, to have taste arati means having no taste this taste arati means having this taste this taste for what jana samsadi jana samsadi means the gathering of worldly people but never gathering of the devotees there are two things shankaracharya makes this point very clear he would always like to be in the company of devotees the like minded people but he would never like to be in the company of so called worldly people who want all worldly things and worldly pleasures their only intention is to have sensory enjoyments this bhakta will have a natural distaste and dislike for so called worldly company but not for the company of devotees he would always seek the company of devotees but he will have this taste and dislike for the company of worldly people as i said this unwavering devotion and one pointed meditation on ishvara can be intensified when we once in a while or on a regular basis we practice nirjana vas sri ramakrishna very strong recommends us maje maje ekant vas korte hobe once in a while if you, you see all this is meant for those who are serious about it. if you are really serious about experiencing ishvara then these things do not if we continuously live in the company of worldly minded people we get infected by the disease of worldliness we should remember that company is very infectious just like we get infected by different diseases worldliness itself is a disease and when we continuously live with worldly kind of people we get infected by the disease of worldliness just like as worldliness is infectious spirituality and bhakti is also infectious if you live in the company of devotees the seekers of god that also infects us positively so that's why narada bhakti sutra says tussanga sarvathai vatyajya narada in bhakti sutra he says tussanga tussanga means bad company should be strictly avoided for a seeker of truth this bad company bad company means nothing else the company of worldly people whose interests are different nothing it is not that they are bad people they are also good people but their interest is only in the worldly thing that is the only thing we are not judging judging them as bad people no they are all good people but they are now drowned in all worldly things so when we be in the company of such people we also shall be infected by that so dussanga sarvathai vatyaja we should give up all such company so this person will have a natural inclination to go into solitude and he would avoid 
the company of all body so that he can have his meditation unbroken and his unwavering devotion for ishwara is perfectly maintained so these are the practices which we have to take to this if at all we have to have that experiential understanding of ishwara then the next verse says adhyatma gyana nityatvam tatva gyana artha darshanam etad gyana miti proktam agyanam yadatu nata what is the next verse adhyatma gyana nityatvam adhyatma gyana gyana means knowledge knowledge of that supreme reality called brahman or ishwar adhyatma gyana nityatvam means this person is steadfast on the path of adhyatma gyana steadfast see he has got no other concern now as i said in the beginning bhagavad gita is a book meant for those who want to experience god those who are not serious about it this book is not going to be relevant for them those who want to put an end to the miseries of life for them this book is relevant those who want to be drowned in the world and suffer that is the same thing as shri ramakrishna beautifully says most of the people in this world the buddha jeevas how are they shri ramakrishna categorizes the humanity into four categories buddha jeeva buddha jeeva is one sadhak or mumukshu is the other the third one is mukta and the fourth one is nitya mukta so buddha jeeva is that who are drowned in all the things of the worldly things they suffer they suffer they repeatedly suffer and yet they would not come to sense and giving a beautiful illustration shri ram krishna would say they are just like a camel a camel which keeps on chewing thorns and the camel is bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and yet the camel will not stop chewing the thorny bush that is the nature of the worldly people they suffer suffer and yet they would not want to come out of this bondage but sadaka is a person who sees these things very clearly he has understood that here there is nothing but suffering that is why his vision is very clear he sees that god alone is the goal of life and it is only in the experience of god that all the sufferings can come to an end and because of this clarity which itself is ishwara's anugraha this clarity cannot come without ishwara's anugraha this desire to experience god which is in shankaracharya's language or in vedanta's language is referred to as mumukshutvam this desire for liberation it comes from from ishwara's anugraha so when this intense longing for attaining liberation comes in our life and all these things become very much relevant so adhyatma gyana nityatvam that steps set fast pursuit of adhyatma gyana spiritual knowledge and then tatva gyanartha darshanam tatva gyan tatva gyan is the experiential knowledge of that supreme reality called brahman tatva gyan not imaginary the word tatvam is very important in vedanta vedanta always talks upon tatva anubhuti it is anubhuti is of state away of the tatvam that reality as it is not as we imagine about it it is tatva gyana so this tatva gyana is the experiential understanding of our own true self and what is the result of this tatva gyana that result is liberation so tatva gyana artha your artha means the result of this tatva gyana tatva gyanartha darshanam that term tatva gyana means the experiential knowledge of the supreme reality and the consequence of this tatva gyana the result of this tatva gyana is what mukti and darshanam shankaracharya says this person's focus is always on that mukti which is the result of tatva gyana means he keeps that mukti as the goal of his life his eyes his vision is always fixed upon that mukti as the goal and that mukti which is 
the outcome of tattva jnana see this is the beautiful thing which we should have in our life in our life what is the goal of human life bhakti 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 in shri ramakrishna's language we would say bhagavat prapti is the only uddesha manushya jeevan er ek matra uddesha ishwar prapti is it not shri ramakrishna in his katha amrit repeatedly says only one thing this ishwar prapti is the ek matra uddesha only one purpose of the human life that ishwar prapti means nothing but mukti nothing but mukti ishwar prapti these are all synonymous terms so here tattva gyanartha darshanam this person's focus is one pointedly fixed on that ultimate goal of mukti and mukti alone which is the outcome of tattva gyanam see see the clarity of this person's life we have to bring this clarity into our life then only we shall be proceeding in this direction without much obstacles so adhyatma gyana nityatvam and tattva gyanartha darshan step fast on the path of self knowledge and eyes fixed on that ultimate goal of mukti which is the outcome of tattva gyana All this long list, starting from Amanitvam to How many virtues? I'm not counted it. Somebody can count it. Maybe some 10 to 15 virtues and disciplines he has mentioned here. Starting from Amanitvam to Tattvagyanartha Darshanam. All this, this bundle of disciplines and virtues is referred to as Jnanam. This itself is Jnanam. Why? Shankaracharya says, why Krishna is saying that this is Jnanam? Because these practices will take us to the real Jnanam. This is the means to have the experience of knowledge of people. Eta Jnanam eti trokta. This is what is Jnanam. When we are practicing when we are putting these disciplines into practice this is what is jnanam because these disciplines will eventually and gradually take us to that experiential understanding about what our true nature is so etat jnanam eti prokta and the opposite of all these virtues the opposite of all these virtues starting from amanitvam to tattva jnanartha darshana starting from humility to this moksha as the goal of life to see it ends with moksha as the goal of life see the vision see the clarity of this person's life he is constantly his eyes are fixed on one goal moksha mukti 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 so anything opposed to these things that is all agyanam agyanam yadatun yatha what is whatever is opposed to these virtues that is all ignorance that is all darkness so shankar kare says then commenting upon this so anything which is opposed to these virtues like arrogance arrogance is the opposite of humility first amanitvam the opposite of amanitvam is manitvam arrogance so arrogance pretentiousness cruelty revenge crookedness insincerity these are all nothing but sign of ignorance so when we are practicing these disciplines called amanitvam adambhutvam ahimsa shanti rajavam acharyo prasanam sautam sthairya atma pranigraha indriyarthesu vairagyam anahankara eva cha janma mrityu jara vyadi dukha doshan darshanam asakti anabhishvanga putra dar grihadishu nityam ca samachitratvam krishta nishkopa patishu mai ca ananya yogena bhakti ravya bhicharani vivikta desha sevitvam aratir jana santati adhyatma jnana nityatvam tattva jnanartha darshanam eta jnanam eti proktam agyanam yada sevantata what a beautiful conclusion these virtues starting from amanitvam to tattva jnanartha darshanam this itself is jnanam because this will eventually take us to that experiential understanding of what each
So everything that is opposed to these virtues, they are all nothing but ignorance. <coughs> now, so what we have discussed today, <coughs> as I said, if we have to understand the true nature of Kshetrakya, again, just reminding, we need to remind, we are meeting once in a week, so there's a gap sometimes we don't forget what we discussed in our earlier classes. Here the whole struggle is to understand our true nature, the true nature of Kshetrakya. It's a clear discrimination between what is Kshetra and what is Kshetrakya, and what is the true nature of Kshetra. In our own body mind complex, we are a bundle of Kshetra and Kshetrakya. You see, this body is Kshetra, and there is some other entity which is the Kshetra, the, the consciousness side, which is inside this very body. But what is the true nature of this Kshetra? Is this Kshetra limited to this one body? What, do you what is its true Swarupa? To understand that, we need to develop certain competence and eligibility. Without that competence and eligibility, that Yogyata, we shall never have the experiential understanding of what this Kshetra is. For that, these great virtues and disciplines are indispensable. No one can do away with these virtues. Everyone has to put these virtues into practice. But once we have done that, now we, now that person is ready to understand what is the true nature of that Kshetra here. Which is the thing to be known. We all want to know the true nature of Kshetragya, the true nature of Ishvara. This chapter started with the idea. Ishvara se tattva nirdharanartham Kshetradhyaya arabhyate. Shankaracharya says, this 13th chapter is commencing in order to ascertain, determine the true nature of Ishvara. To do that, we need to go through all these disciplines, without which it cannot happen. Now, any person who has really practiced all these disciplines regularly over a long period of time, then comes the true nature of Kshetra. Now, oh, that is the description going to start from now on. From verse 12 to verse 17, in these six verses, Krishna is giving a majestic and magnanimous description of what this Kshetra is. Kshetragya is the true nature of Ishvara, that ultimate reality, which is the one thing to be known. As human beings, our one concern should be to experience this reality. Without this, the human life has been lived in vain, literally vain. It is human beings alone who can do this. Animals cannot do this. But Shankaracharya repeated to say in his books, <clears throat> it is only the human being who has got the capability to understand this supreme reality. No other animals can do that. So we are all privileged. We are all gifted by that supreme providence with a special yogita, which is given only to the human species. And if we are not utilizing it for this great purpose, that will be a great loss. The Shankaracharya repeatedly says in the great Purana. So beautiful. <coughs> so now starts the next verse. Krishna says, <coughs> He says, Geyam yatat pravakshyami yadyatvamrita mashnute anadimat param brahma nasatanna sadutkate. What is it saying? Krishna is saying, Geyam. Geyam means that which is to be known. What is to be known? Ishwar. Ishwara's true nature. Again, let me remember, whenever we talk about Ishwara's true nature, it is our own true nature. It is our story. It is not Ishwara, it's not somebody existing separated from us. This is the one idea which should be deeply impressed in our minds. The moment we talk about God or Ishvara, we think God is something which is existing separated from me. 
such an idea may be good in the initial stages. Yes, most of us, we live with such an idea, as if God is existing separately from us. But we need to understand that Ishwara is our very self. He is our own true nature. In fact, our own true nature is that. So, Ishwara's true nature means our own true nature. We are that. We are not this what we are thinking ourselves to be. As long as our, this wrong notion about ourselves continues, there is no end to human sufferings and misery. That is the thing. It is only when we take this very seriously, when we take this great subject very seriously, then some wonderful transformation can be expected in human life. And it is going to happen. So, Gayam. Gayam means that which is to be known. What is to be known? Our true nature, which is nothing but one with that entity called Ishvara or Parabrahman. So that is Gayam. Gayam means that which is to be known. Yat Tat Pravaksha means, Bhagavan Krishna says, I am now going to tell you, dear Arjun, it is as if Bhagavan Krishna is addressing all of us. Krishna is addressing Arjun. Dear Arjun, now I am going to tell about that which is to be known. So Krishna is telling all of us, my dear children, now I am going to tell what you are actually supposed to know. That is the real knowledge. Knowledge of the world is no knowledge at all. Sri Ramakrishna very beautifully says, Bhagavan er jnani jnan, Bhagi sab agyan. So beautiful, so striking, amazing statement. In Kathamrita you can see, Bhagavan er jnani jnan, Bhagi sab you may be knowing physics, you may be knowing chemistry, you may be knowing neuroscience and all these things. It's all Ajnana Mundi. As long as we don't know our own true self, we are all in darkness, in utter darkness. You should know this. So the knowledge of the self, the knowledge of Ishwara alone is the true knowledge. Everything else is ignorance and ignorance alone. So what is Gayam? That our own true nature is Gayam. Gayam means to be known, the thing to be known. Means Ishvara or Parabrahma. Krishna says, Pravakshyami. I am going to tell about that. Gayam Yatat Pravakshyami. And what happens when you have the knowledge of this Ishvara? Yadhyatva Amritatvam Ashmitu. When you have the, the experiential understanding of this Ishvara, what happens is Yadhyatva Amritatvam Ashmitu. That person attains immortality. That person becomes free from all misery and suffering in life. Who doesn't want to become free from misery and life? Anyone here? You can raise your hand and say, Swamiji, I don't want to be free from misery and life. Anyone here in this congregation? Everyone wants to become free from misery in life. But only thing is that we don't know how to put an end to this misery. There is only one way. Literally, there is only one way. There is no two way. There is no second way to put an end to the misery that life. Miseries and sufferings can come to an end only, only and only when we know our true self. Otherwise, it is never going to happen. This is the conclusion of the Vedas. Sarva Dukkha Nivritti, Atyantika Dukkha Nivritti can come only when this Paramatma Prapti takes place. When this Atma Gyan takes place, when we know the true nature of Ishwara, then only we can put an end to all the sufferings of the human life. And we become immortal. Amritatvam Ashmite. He attains immortality. We become freed from birth and death. There is no more birth for that person. There is no more death for that person. He becomes immortal. Yad Gyatva Amritatvam Ashmite. And what is that? Thing to be known, now starts the real description. From here onwards, fill the 17th verse. We shall take it up slowly. So here one line we can take it up today and the rest of the things we can take in the next class. Because I don't want to leave it in between. The next class we can take the whole set together. The majestic description of that supreme reality, that Ishwara, which is our true nature. We are that. That is the thing. We should always connect ourselves with that. We should not think that, oh, we are different and that is different. 
It is our description that is going to come now in the next five verses. We are like this. We in our true self, we are like this. Not knowing it, we are suffering. Knowledge, jnanam, atma jnanam is the one thing which puts an end to all suffering in life. So what is the description? It says, Anadimat Param Brahma. That Param Brahma, again, Param Brahma means our own true nature. It is Anadimat. Anadimat means that which is without beginning. Anadi. Anadi means that which is without beginning. It has got no beginning. Our true nature, the body was born on a certain day and it is going to die on a certain day. But we are not that. We are that entity which never had birth, which, which is without any beginning. We are immortals. That is why the Upanishad is so fond of addressing all of us as Amrtatvasya Putra. Vaitashvata Upanishad. It addresses everybody as Amrtatvasya Putra. The children of immortal bliss. Swami Vivekananda was very fond of addressing everybody. Because that is the truth. It is only when we don't know this that we suffer life. So, Anadimat Param Brahma. This Param Brahma, our own true nature, is that which is without the And then what? Na Sat. Na Asad Uchatu. That Brahma, which is our true nature, we cannot say that it is Sat. And we cannot say that it is us. What does it mean? This I will take it up in the next class. It's a very important statement. What it means is that this Brahman about which we cannot say that it is a being or it is a non-being. We cannot say it is this or that. We cannot talk about it. This is a subject which you can see continuously existing and deliberated upon in all the Upanishads. It is beyond all verbal description. This we shall take it up in the next part. This Brahman which is Anadi, Brahman means what? Our own true nature. It is indescribable. It cannot be described in verbal terms. Nor can it be objectified by the sense organs and the mind. That is the meaning of this statement. It is neither being nor it is non-being. This we shall take it up. So in short, what we have discussed today, if you just see, we have finished this entire group of disciplines, this group of virtues, which is indispensable for anyone who wants an experiential understanding of what we provide. So that entire range of disciplines, this is the one thing everyone will have to take it seriously, if at all we have to make progress in spiritual life. Without this, nothing is going to this is what is sadhana, spiritual practice, 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 sadhana. There is no spiritual life without sadhana. That is why spiritual life demands sadhana. We have to be doing it wherever we are. Now, let us not think that, oh, we are in family, it is not possible. These are all just vain and silly pretexts. If it had been not possible, Sri Krishna would not be talking about it. Everyone can do it wherever we are in the family setting itself. It is a question of the seriousness with which we are pursuing this great pursuit. If we are really serious about it, everybody can touch it. That is the point. So with this we stop the session here and in the next class we shall see the beautiful description of what is this Ishwara, what is our own true nature. This we shall see in the next class. A majestic description which is coming now. Amazing. This you will find in all the Upanishads. That amazing picture of one reality is shining everywhere. In so many forms. Amazing. We are seeing God. We are not understanding this. This is going to be the next description now. What are we seeing with our open eyes? It is God existing in so many forms. Literally sitting before us. When we don't understand that, we say it is Jagat. We say it is Jeev. We say it is man. We say it is woman. Where is God? We are seeing God. This is the simple truth that the Upanishads teach us. 
Uh, this is going to be the description which will come in the next five amazing verses, which we shall take it up in the next. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shanti.